Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. In this week's episode, we're discussing a new site in Sweden that's building a media empire around explainer journalism. Per Grankvist had the kind of media career most journalists only dream of. He was a high-profile columnist for a leading newspaper and a regular face on one of Sweden's top broadcast networks. But over time, he grew disillusioned with mainstream media and its tendency to dumb down coverage of complicated policy issues. So Per quit his traditional media job and launched his own outlet. It started with just an Instagram account that explained thorny election issues, but from there it blossomed into an entire media outlet that spanned across social media, podcasts, and newsletters. I recently interviewed Pear about how he built the company, his approach to monetization, and whether he misses working for mainstream media publications. Before we jump into the interview, I just wanted to pause for a moment and thank those listeners who have taken the time to subscribe to my Substack newsletter. Without those subscribers, this podcast wouldn't be financially sustainable. Thanks for supporting the work of an independent journalist who works hard every week to deliver you media insights that will make you better at your job. If you haven't yet subscribed and want to support the work I do for this podcast, go to simonowens.substack.com. That's simonowens.substack.com. Or just Google the words Simon Owens and newsletter. Okay, on to my interview with Pear. Hey, Pear, thanks for joining us. Hello, how are you? Uh, So I think what initially intrigued me enough to have you on the show is that you said that that you're basically running the Nordic version of Vox.com. For the uninitiated, Vox is a very public policy-focused website in the U.S. Uh, Before we get into that, I wanted to start with talking about how you got into the news business in the first place. Like, I think you started out as just like an independent blogger blogging during your free time, right? That's right. I was blogging on the topic of sustainability and trying to understand and explain how companies could work with sustainability and make money at the same time. And sustainability, just for parlance, uh, it's like a mixture of environmental issues, how um, how companies can reduce their impact on the environment, things like that, right? Yep. And also the social aspect of it, sort of the supply chain and how you treat your people and your employees and and uh, diversity questions so it's the full bag uh, and i was seeing that company was starting to do this and from a business perspective which was quite new in sweden so i thought i'd cover that and after a few years i got picked up i turned up on the radar on the uh, swedish business week and so they acquired the blog and asked me to head up their sustainability section that was both online and events and in the paper um, and so I started to do that for a couple of years. Uh, and then, and, and what were you doing as like a day job while you were an independent blogger? Like, was, were you working in sustainability or was just, was this just an interest that you had? It was started off as an interest. I was working as the, uh, head of sales and marketing at Wayne's coffee, which is basically the Starbucks equivalent in the region. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that was sort of my day job. And then I quit and, and started a blog and then started to do some freelance works. So sort of talking about sustainability, this was an all new field. And I was sort of leaning into this, uh, trying to explain things. So how did, how did you how did you find that audience for your blog, you know, before you had any kind of institutional support? Well, well, the audience found me, I think, uh, and so a lot of people start to reach out and, and uh, ask if I wanted to come see them, and, and I reached out to a few companies say, hey, I need to understand this a bit more, and, and those companies were Ikea and, and uh, H&M and companies of that sort, uh, and they found me sort of well-read on the topic, and we had great conversation, and that turned, turned into articles and sometimes speaking gigs and so on. And so you said Swedish Business Week acquired you. Is that the Swedish version of the American magazine Business Week? No, it's a, it's it's a it's a similar magazine. It's actually called Business Week in Swedish, Veckans um, Affärer. But it, it's basically the same. But it's it's not affiliated. And did they have you just come on and start blogging on their website? Yeah, they did that, and also they made me an editor and publisher. So I got to head up uh, a new division focusing on covering these issues, uh, the emerging climate issues, the emerging supply chain issues, and so on. Um, And we did that in an omni-channel way, which was kind of new and pioneering in that field. And it sounds like Um, Swedish takes the sustainability stuff more seriously than they do in the U.S. 
Yes, uh, we do, but we're also a bit full of ourselves. So we come from a more sort of systemic point of view. Here is some research and I've done this. Let's do this together. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not business, business oriented at all, uh, but more for a moral perspective or a moral high ground. Uh, what you could say is sort of a bit of a, uh, the Greta approach. Um, but so th there wasn't an approach here where we look at how can we make business of it? How can we make money of this? And so that was something I brought to the table. And so working for that magazine, did it raise your national profile? Like obviously Sweden is a relatively small country compared to the US. Uh, you became well, relatively well known, right? As a intellectual. Yeah, you could say that. So, I mean, sort of, I'm a curious person, so I'm trying to understand things. And someone said I was sort of uh, called me the Malcolm Gladwell of Sweden of sorts because I was sort of constantly getting interested in all kinds of new stuff. Oh, here's something called filter bubbles. Oh, here's something sort of the social media, how that works. Here's, uh, uh, and so I tried to explain it as soon as I learned something, and that gave me a reputation, and that landed me a new job. As the on the opinion pages of one of the bigger newspapers in Sweden, Sid Svenskan. Um, it's the third biggest national newspaper here. And I also got a gig at the Swedish national broadcaster, SVT, the equivalent of PBS in the US. Yeah, so you became, so not just well-known in printed pap papers, but was it your voice or were you also appearing on TV? I was also appearing on TV. I do have much more of a sort of a radio uh, appearance, uh, but I was forced on TV. So every Friday, I would come along together with two other people on a panel and discuss today's news and, and try to make, make sense of it all. That was basically my job. So you were recognizable. Like if you were walking down the street, people would recognize who you are. Yeah, at least old people would do. Uh, <laughs> my mother would watch everything. But, but young people wouldn't recognize me because they would never watch sort of linear broadcast uh, in, the, in the mornings. And you compared yourself to Malcolm Gladwell. I think you've also compared yourself to Ezra Klein in terms of the stature and subject matter. Um, so did you expand beyond sustainability to more public policy in general? I did, yeah. Um, it's sort of... People asked me to explain all kinds of things. I'm basically the sort of the explainer here. Uh, and so that was the profile I was getting. Uh, and, and I mean, I admire Esther Klein and Malcolm Gladwell. I think other people have compared me in a Swedish context. Uh, but I, I mean, they're, they're doing a great job and I'm really inspired by them. But I shouldn't say I, I, I am them here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you're you're writing for these newspapers. You have a regular gig uh, you, you know, at this major broadcaster, this is kind of the dream, uh, for the journalist. Uh, but you, you eventually kind of got sick of traditional media. Why is that? Cause I had too many middle managers who were saying me what to do and how to explain things and what topics to explain and in what format they should be explained. And I was saying, well, in social media, it works differently. In digital, it works differently. Um, you, you need to link people to the original sources. You need to be snappy, but if you got, get your attention, you can then go on for 20 minutes without problem. Um, and so they're always trying to make it write shorter or write different or talk sort of slower and in different ways. And, and, and so, so I felt that I was a bit fed up with that. And since I wrote the book on filter bubbles, I also wrote another book on sort of the, the truth and, and, and falsehoods in society. And a third book on sort of, is, is sort of civic engagement in the new era. I felt there was a space here where all those issues converged. And I was trying to, how can we help people understand the news in a, in a context in social media? How could we get people to be more informed uh, in the channels where they actually are and communicate? Because all the media houses, they were trying to so drive traffic to the websites. Uh, I felt like, why, why, why don't we just explain things to them in the channels that, where they are? And so I resigned and I started to uh, initiative prior to the last general election here. Uh, where I talked about all these things. Um, so sort of how does an election work? Uh, it's cool, actually called the Velja School and the electorate school. Uh, it was uh, impartial. It was trying to be objective, trying to be sort of the classical norms of journalism, but in a, in a new context. And this was just you, like this was like a one pers person media project, right? Yeah, completely. Uh -huh. And so you, so you, so you had these high stature jobs at these big newspapers, big broadcasters, you quit those jobs. 
you launch this new news site that's more focused on just explaining the news in a slow way, usually evergreen stuff. Did it? Did that start on Instagram? Yeah, it starts Instagram. It still lives on Instagram. Um, and in uh, in hundred days, we gained twenty three thousand followers, starting from zero. So that was pretty good. And the reach we get got on Instagram. Uh, it was me, and then I hired a sort of uh, freelance photographer, and I hired someone else to help out as well. But it was mainly me, and 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 uh, uh, we got a reach of 120,000 accounts until last week prior to election, and we got 2.1 million views on Instagram. So suddenly we were huge. This was the biggest account in politics, explaining politics in Sweden. So give me a hypothetical post that you would have created on Instagram and what it would have looked like visually and also from a tech standpoint. The, the, a, a typical post would sort of explain something that this issue of, for example, healthcare. Uh, then you have to, to put your vote in the regional election. It is not a national vote. It is not a local vote. We have three levels here. So here's what it stands for, uh, and here's the three major things you need to, to look out for. Uh, this would all be packaged in 2,200 uh, characters, uh, and it would basically have an image, or maybe I will sometimes do a story of it, but which was sort of really basic, really boring in a way. But coming from having a sort of bit of a tech background, a geek background, I would always try to be as useful as possible. So you should be able to get the grit of it in the first sort of three lines, because then you have to, to click in order to get the full post. You will have a sense of it. You will say, okay, aha. We're always trying to look for that sort of aha moment. It, will, it would make you feel slightly smarter. It would bring something that you could bring to the dinner table and have a conversation with a friend. It will also be in sort of friendly conversation, sort of uh, much more like, okay, Simon, you probably know a bit about this already, but I'm just trying to summarize it quickly. So it was very friendly, inclusive, and you would say, aha, okay, I didn't know that. Great, thanks. You would like it and then move on in your feed. Were you, so trying, to do, more- were you trying to do anything with like data visualization or anything like that using the images? No, not at this point. Uh, I had done a project prior to that where I used sort of Twitter data trying to understand the different sort of political bubbles on the Swedish Twitter. I did actually that in, in starting off with American Twitter and that made me sort of uh, make the pro- sort of, um, I, I'm trying to find a word, here, the projection um, of that Donald, that Donald Trump would be the president a week before the election, uh, last election. Uh, so that went fairly well. So I, I'm, I'm geeky in that sense, but and uh, we are now again. Uh, but we didn't do it with just plain explanations of facts. Uh, no opinions, no angles on this or that, but just sort of the plain facts served in a format that was part of the platform. So you have this surprisingly successful Instagram account. What year was this? This is uh, 2018. 2018, you have this surprisingly successful Instagram account becomes one of the most popular political Instagram accounts in Sweden. The election happens. What happened? Like, how did you, how did you decide to expand beyond just that initial Instagram account and build a whole media company out of it? Well, I, I had made a list of boring topics that I wanted to explore to see if I can actually get some traction. Because if I could get traction for boring topics, then that would mean I actually had my hypothesis would be right on how to drive engagement. And so the second on that list, I continued to that list. I was sort of private economy, uh, personal business things. And that went really well as well. Uh, and so I felt there's something going on here. And then I founded a brand called Vaviviet, which means what we know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was in November uh, two years ago, uh, and I realized I actually had a media business on my hand, explaining things, uh, trying to to uh, just get people a bit smarter in their own feeds. And so I just started. I mean, building a media business in this way, you find something and you strike sort of social gold in a way, <laughs> and you build it out from there. There wasn't a big business plan or anything. It just started because people, I had the engagement and people were flocking to the accounts and, and uh, then I was just trying to find a, a build a business around it. How did you start expanding off of Instagram? Like you eventually built out a website, you started launching podcasts, talk about how, and, and how did you start expanding beyond just you? Did you take on venture capital investment or grants? Like what, how did it evolve into something more ambitious? We we are a um, what we vet. What we know is now a media company, but we're also a tech company. So I will always I always been trying to build up a tech stack that can allow us to be 
um, get the engagement and the reach that we wanted by optimizing publishing times, by so analyzing all the data that we got from the platform. So that gave me a head start and then attracted some advertisers who said, we have these really complex issues that we need someone to explain in a way that people can understand it. Could you do that for us? And I'm like, sure, why not? Um, so we always trying, there always been some advertiser that could we drive conversion? Could we drive sort of that? And, and we, we tried that and it failed. But if you want us to complain, to explain something more complex, that was fine. And we got the big brand fairly quickly. And now we have major banks and we have major, uh, or services companies and, and, and all kinds who have sort of Spotify as a client and whatnot. Um, and, and so that started and then you bring on some more people and more people, but we've been profitable basically since two years back. Uh, and then during the pandemic, of course, the, the advertiser um, revenue fell like stone of basically overnight. But then we had a tech stack that we realized that here's something of value, here's an asset we can use. And then we brought on companies who can actually use that tech platform to, to publish in their social feeds, uh, optimizing through our data. So that's a big revenue for us as well. Um, but we brought on people and then we had to fire people and then we brought on people again. But now, I mean, in the media context, there's a lot of people out there who want to have an extra gig. They can go on Substack, but they can also write for us uh, and, and, and well thought pieces explaining things in a dry, but at the same time, quite fun way that get people engaged. And so that's also an, uh, 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 an attractive position, uh, an attractive offer that we today uh, with what we, get, uh, what we know, you actually get the best tools for expressing yourself in this platform uh, with a big credibility. And then you bring on someone who knows a lot of stuff about sort of personal finance or, or uh, politics or uh, gardening or whatever. And then you can build out on, on that. So we now so, have. So you, more so you mean like you're, you're hiring freelancers, like they're, you're paying them to write for you. Yeah. Um, so that's sort of the, 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 the major model today. We do have some employees as well, uh, but that's the major model of growth, trying to find people who are really good at explaining and then they will prove themselves and then we'll give them more and more things to do. So from a from a from a monetization uh, standpoint, you started out doing kind of native advertising where they would pay you to create kind of like the explainer content that you were already creating on the editorial side. And then, you know, after COVID, you realize you had a tech stack. It sounds almost like a Hootsuite where it's a platform that makes it easier for people to schedule out and optimize their social media points. So you created like a SaaS like product that you were already using internally and basically started licensing it out to businesses. Yep, that's that's correct. Uh -huh. And the thing is that, and, and the business model. So we have the SaaS, we have the the uh, native, which is still a big part of it. Uh, and then uh, we operate. I mean, we operate on the. We have a distributed model. So basically, it's social media, it's podcasting, and it's newsletters. So we only operate the site like a repository for all the content that we have, but we don't try to drive people to the website all the time. That's not our business model at all, uh, mm -hmm. but to be where people are. So it's newsletters, it's podcasting, it's the social media. And what is the podcast? Like, you, I think you create several different ones. Are they narrative podcasts? Are they interview podcasts? Like, how are you approaching podcasting? Both, I say, they always have to have a sort of a fact-based thing, sort of uh, helping people understand things. Uh, it could be understanding how you launch a company. It could be understanding general topics. Um, I have an interview podcast just like this one, where I try to understand experts' take on uh, current affairs. Um, but it could also be that we have someone, a, a few podcasts in parenting, and we have some sort of work-life balance and so on. Um, but then we also have a tech stack in podcasting, and we are um, – so we have other companies, other media companies launching podcasts using our technology, and then we optimize it in order to make sure that it gets the reach and engagement that, that they want. How mature is the podcasting market in Sweden? Obviously, Spotify is from there, and Spotify has been making some huge investments in podcasting. Is it? I don't know anything about the Swedish market for podcasting. Well, I think it's it's, it's mature in many ways. Um, um, Spotify is now bigger than Apple here, which is quite an achievement uh, because everyone here is on Apple. There's an really insane amount of, of Apple devices here. Uh, so everyone's but basically geared to Apple Podcast. But Spotify made some smart investments and, and being part of the ecosystem, 
we were actually asked by Spotify, who is a client of ours, to create their new sort of trying to push into uh, content for kids. So we created this uh, entire series trying to explain things about animals, uh, <laughs> sort of five to eight minutes um, episodes aimed at kids, basically six to ten. Um, so and, and they are really fun to work with and they're really sort of, sort of visionary in many ways. But then it's about changing habits and you change habits by offering the best content. Um, I mean, that's basically the Netflix model and that is now turning into Spotify's model as well. So it's much easier for them to acquire talent, make them exclusive like Joe Rogan, and then put them on the platform and then just wait it out. Uh, and people will eventually sort of sw- switch apps. Can you give me the the sense of your audience size? Like how much reach does your site have versus like some of the more mainstream publications? We have in total across platforms, we are approaching 150,000 subscribers and that's subscribers to newsletters, podcasts, and our social media accounts. Uh, and that is mainly, uh, we're not, we just, we're not targeting women, but our audiences are women. Uh, so 85% of audiences women in the range of 25 to 45 years old. That's the main demographic that we reach. Um, and so we are, um, but whenever we do something, when we're covering the American election and so on, we then have a reach of, of, above uh, 1 million people in Sweden, mainly women. Uh, and that's half, that's basically 50% of that demographic in Sweden. And then, other, I mean, there's a lot of other news organizations and that are very good here. Um, they have higher reach in number, but they don't have higher reach in that specific demographic. And do you feel like you do you feel like you're a powerful force in like Swedish life in terms of like affecting politics? Do major politicians read you? Like what's what's what, how much influence does your site have? It's difficult to answer when you're in the bubble, but a lot of the uh, most of the big influencer accounts and celebrity accounts in Sweden that are known for being interested in facts and figures and trying to understand things or being more factual. If a celebrity and influencer could be that, they are all our followers. So when we bring up a topic, we can then see that they are sharing and they are talking about it. Um, but we don't sort of measure it in that sort of um, factual way. <laughs> we note that that stuff that we bring up are then being distributed or talked about. Um, so yes, we do have an influence in that in that sense. And you have a paywall, right? Like, what do you put behind the paywall? Um, the uh, we have a soft paywall, you could say. We have a paywall which means you, you just give us your email address and you will uh, access 80% of our content. And then we have a paid paywall uh, where we could get more of it. And we are still elaborating to see what should go to where uh, because that is on our website. Uh, so that's basically a, a, an asset where we, if you become a, a subscriber to the newsletter, um, which is basically an Axios style newsletter that summarizes the week every Saturday, in less than five minutes, will you get to the grist? They will get you these sort of facts on the bigger stories of this week. So it's it's a way of us to sort of get those emails, and that is just fast growing. Um, but we get it, it. We don't have. I mean, we do have a small subscription business where people are actually paying for it, and that will probably be bigger in the future. But we're still sort of very much in the early days of that. And so it's it's interesting that you compare yourself to Ezra Klein sometimes because Ezra Klein has a has an interesting uh, career trajectory. Like you, he started out as a blogger, then he moved into more mainstream media. He was at the Washington Post. Then he he got frustrated with mainstream media and split off and started Vox. But I don't know how much you follow it, but he just got a job. He just left Vox and has joined the New York Times as like an opinion columnist. Uh, Another one of his co-founders of Vox, uh, Matt Iglesias, just split off and started his own Substack account. You see a lot of uh, big name journalists now launching their own Substacks. I I don't know. I guess like what about you? Like do you do you think what do you think the future for this? Do you want to be kind of like a media mogul sp- spreading into other countries? Do you think this will be acquired by, you know, a Swedish media company? Do you ever see yourself going back into to kind of more mainstream media? What's kind of your ambition? Well, our ambition is to um make facts true again. <laughs> That's our ambition and our ambition is to be the, the Nordic force in making facts true again, to explain the news and do that in a very factual way and a fun way as well uh, in the channels where you 
are already, uh, so you don't have to go to our site. So that's basically our, our ambition. Um, and I left big media in order to start this, uh, and it's going fairly well, I should say. And so that's where you that's where we are at. And I think this is a shift going on in the past five, ten years. I mean, social media and digital media and all that has changed the nature of media and changed the role of journalism. And in the Nordic region, the, the, the media companies here, they haven't changed enough. They are basically having the same old business models and the same old offer that they used to have. There's a lot of opinion journalism going on. There's a lot of commentary, but it's not that lot of going on in terms of explanatory journalism that will make you smarter. And so there's a niche here um, that's, that we try to carve out. And I think that there's sort of the boxes and, and, and you have the, the BuzzFeed and you have the stuff going on at the Post and at the Journal and at the Times that I'm very inspired by. Um, and we'll see in the future. I think there, there's, there's lots of space to create new media companies here now. Um, if you start off basically from scratch or if you pour a lot of money into it and, and restart yourself like the, the, uh, the, the Journal and, and the Post have done, um and uh, so yeah sure I, th I think there's there's stories being needs to be, that need to be told in a local context and i think sweden is a very small language area it's only 10 million inhabitants it's basically a mid-sized u.s city um but then you get you get into the, the other nordic countries and then you have a margin of 25 to, to 30 million people um and if when we're covering the u.s election we do that thoroughly and we explain things and then it's just a matter of sort of translating it and then of course you have to have local presence especially in podcasting um and so i think there's there's a lot of us you would do there's a lot to do there's a certain scale you can achieve and of course i mean i'm in here for a long run i think i'm a a, a good <laughs> media owner we are profitable and we're operating and we're now looking much more into the future and what we can do and, and what we could be the next step for us to acquire talent or acquire other websites or should we use venture capital? That's a conversation we will actually have with the board tomorrow. Um, and so I've been sort of trying to sort of plan for the next step, but we haven't decided yet. But the head of the, the, the biggest national broadcaster here, uh, the Swedish radio, I mean, the, the former head has now joined our board as the chairman um, uh, and, and she sees great potential. And then we also have people from the more commercial side. And we also have people from the, the NGO side on our board that provides a different perspective on society. Uh, and that gives us several lenses to look to or at society, to explain society, but also to our own future, uh, the way we should be. Um, but I definitely see that in the future, to get the stability you need and, and the trustworthiness you need, you, you might want to have to diversify the the, um, the ownership uh, beyond being just just myself and my family and, and, and uh, a few a small number of others into maybe you should have bigger players. And so you think you could end up, you know, expanding into other countries? We are expanding into to other the Nordic countries to start with. Um, to prove ourselves, I mean, we, we think we found the recipe in Sweden now. Now, now it's it's more about scaling, scaling into new topics, scaling into new markets, um, and we are definitely inspired by the stuff a lot of media companies doing in Europe and in here uh, um, and in the US. So, um, I hope to to be one of those sort of explanatory journalism pioneers, at least in Europe. Mm -hmm. Okay, Per, well, those were all the questions I had for you. Where can people find your work online? Um, they will find it uh, and, and they will Google. Uh, they will use uh, uh, Google Translate. <laughs> but if you go to www.se, uh, which is short for uh, VVV, uh, with simple V, uh, and that's V for Victor, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to do that again. If you go to uh, vvv.se and that will get into our website and then use Google Translate to get a sense of it. Uh, and then obviously people will find me everywhere. I'm sure there will be a link in the show notes to, so they can pronounce my name or find it. <laughs> awesome. Hopefully. All right. Well, thanks so much. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for joining us. I'm actually on the lookout for new guests for this podcast. So if you do interesting stuff in digital content, whether you're, you're a full-time YouTuber, a media executive, or run a cool niche newsletter, definitely reach out. My email address is simonowens at gmail.com. Okay, see you next week.